Hey everybody, welcome into Redacted on this Wednesday. I'm Clayton Morris. I'm Natalie Morris. And uh, yes, glad to have my better half back, um, who was a little, uh, little travel, little travel. Little personal time, but I'm back. Here I go. Let me crack my knuckles. We got a lot to handle. People, people are wondering if it was like a Kate Middleton situation. Oh, how do I prove to them that this is like... Not AI? Let's see. Um, I can show you the screen on my phone that it's... Actually, no, you see, no, this is yeah. embarrassing. Um, <laughs> the, see the date? No, that doesn't that doesn't work. So. That doesn't help. You got to hold up like a newspaper with a date or okay. something. Um, hey, we've got a busy show for you on this Wednesday. We tonight are going to talk about the latest in this bridge collapse story. And man, there's a lot of moving pieces on this. And the Biden administration's response to it is very curious. What are intelligence sources saying this afternoon about what went on there? We'll do that. And we're also going to talk about uh, what the FBI had to say. Uh, they are watching what you watch on YouTube and they are asking Google if you watch a video they don't like or they think is dangerous to give them your address, your name, your IP address. That's interesting, right? Because we're all here on YouTube. Interesting that we could be surveyed just for whatever the algorithm brings you. Please keep watching Redacted, though. Uh, they know anyway. So stay with us. Yeah. Also, Stella Assange is going to join us tonight, the wife and lawyer for Julian Assange. Um, we're going to get an update on where things stand right now with that court case and the hearing and the appeals process right now. So we're going to talk to Stella Assange uh, here on Redacted in just a little bit. So welcome into the show on this Wednesday. Good to see all of you guys. Let us know where you're joining us from around the world. And uh, Harry says, bring back the countdown timer. See, some people are so regimented. We 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 yeah. for th we had the thirty minute countdown timer beforehand, and we thought maybe it'll just be better if we just come right out and start the show because that thirty minute countdown timer. So many people complained about it. So many people were like, "God, I have to fast forward through the thirty minute thing all the time." So we thought, you know, for the next month we're going to try this and see how it is. And so far. It's been great. There's already like 20,000 of you watching, so it seems to be working. So I'm sorry, Harry. Change is hard. It's hard I for know. us, too, because without it, we're like, wait, where? When, I know normally we're like, show? Redacted starts. We're like, no, we don't have to say that anymore because it's already, we already did the open and all of that. So anyway, anyway, Natalie's not feeling so good. She was off for a few days and then now she's back, but she's got a little cold. A little I think head I cold. have uh, probably so many of you have this right now when the weather changes and your allergies kick in a little and you're like, am I sick? Or is this allergies? I feel kind of funky, but I'm here. Let me know if you have that. Is there a word for it? Like non-allergy, non-sickness? Uh, I don't need a vaccine for it. Thank you very much. I also don't want a mask. Uh, so if you offer that, I'll say no to both. But I work is good. I work think a lot. Me honest. I think a lot of people, David Phillip. I mean, I think everyone's having this allergy issue right now, and then the rain kicks it up, and all of this stuff. So I don't yeah, know. I, I usually get that when there's a massive change in weather. Mm -hmm. That's, I always get, it, yeah. it has to be like massive and then I get sick. Yeah. Well, here we go. Yeah. So We're anyway, here. anyway, pollen time, it's pollen time, but it's, it's, you know, it's now springtime. So it's officially spring, but anyway, <laughs> someone says it's disease X. No, it's not. <laughs> it's not disease X. <laughs> it's a sniffle. <laughs> Well, hey, while Natalie was gone, uh, the national debt increased a few billion dollars. Oh, we went from 33 to 34. Uh, well, no, it's been 34 for a while, but oh. that's, I'm saying billions. Not that, not that she's responsible for it. It's, no. not, it's not because Natalie was gone that it went up a few billion. It, no. It, well, I don't know. But yesterday I had two lattes. Well. Didn't is, charge them to my credit card to pay debt. cash. All right, let's get into some news, shall we, on this uh, Wednesday. So what are they hiding? Left-wing media really wants you to ignore the inconsistencies and reporting around the, the bridge collapse story. What is really going on here? So anytime the left-wing media, by the way, uh, tells you to look one way, I always want to look the other way. Um, so almost immediately after the crash, President Biden came out, gave a press conference, like first thing in the morning, uh, before his flight, where he said the federal government would put uh, would pay the full bill for this crash. The full bill, really? The federal government is footing the bill 100% for this? Uh, I don't seem to remember him doing this for the people of East Palestine, Ohio, after Norfolk Southern train derailed. Um, no one, you know, remember when we had, of course, the, the massive disaster there. I don't, did you guys remember that? I don't remember the, like, the Biden administration coming back. You know what? We're going to rebuild your community. No questions asked. We're going to take care of everything and we're going to rebuild. No. Mm -mm. Good point. Biden didn't go there. In fact, he didn't even go there for a year. 
people were like, when are you going to actually go to East Palestine, Ohio? And then uh, when he did go there, what did he do? He called out Norfolk Southern as greedy. <laughs> That's what he did. He basically said that it was their fault, they're greedy. So, okay, quite a different tone. Also the same thing in, in Hawaii, the Lahaina fires. I mean, I, I could go down a laundry list of, of instances where this, this bridge collapse in Baltimore is kind of different, don't you think? Ohio residents had been calling on Biden to declare a federal disaster, seek them, seek help from the EPA, because many people are now experiencing life-altering health problems. So before his appearance there just a few weeks ago, the residents are like, um, you know, can you have the EPA issue some sort of investigation here? Because we're suffering all kinds of health problems here. So it's very strange that Biden came right out and immediately declared federal money and a response. Watch. I spoke with Governor Moore this morning, as well as the mayor of Baltimore, the county executive, United, to both United States senators and the congressman. And my secretary of transportation is on the scene. I told them we're going to send all the federal resources they need as we respond to this emergency. And I mean all the federal resources. And we're going to rebuild that port together. Mm. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, all of it. And then a reporter even like was like, hey, did I just hear you correctly? Did you just really say what I think you said? Because that's odd. And good, good for this reporter to do like an immediate follow up. A lot of the times it just goes right over people's heads and they don't cont they don't understand the context of this. But this this reporter managed to ask this question. Wait a second. Did I hear you correctly, Mr. President? Watch. The federal government's also going to pay for the repairs. I'm just curious. This was a ship that appears to be at fault. Is there any reason to believe that the company behind the ship should be held responsible? And then also, you that mentioned happened. we're going to pay for it to get the bridge rebuilt and opened. What did you? Hmm. It's interesting. It's an amazing response to have first thing in the morning. Like, it happens at 1:27 a.m. Yeah. First thing in the morning, the Biden administration already has a response to this, and they're they've all they also in that same press conference said nothing to see here. Uh, Okay. Well, as one of our favorite Twitter accounts, Cat Turd, pointed out, the bridge collapsed at 1.30 a.m. By 8 a.m. the next morning, all officials had done an investigation and determined it was just an accident. Four hours later, Biden hit the mic and said taxpayers would pay for the full rebuild. Nothing to see here. Pull my finger. <laughs> so maybe it is nothing, right? Maybe we just foot the bill and then you pay us back, right? You, the shipping company, Forrester, the you know, group, or I'm sorry, Maersk. It's all weird ownership structure. But anyway, you'll pay us back. But the train crash is a great example of how there were arguments over who was at fault. There's litigation, even still, whose insurance should be paying for it. So um, I guess we pay for all accidents now. Does that include, you know, to what level, right? Right. To what level? If I drive into a pole... Do I not have to pay for that? Right. I mean, exactly. I mean, this is if this is an accident, then shouldn't the federal government just pay for all of our accidents now? Like, and what level rises to the like the level the Fed, the federal government's going to step in? What if I'm on a small boat? You know, right. When I and I have just an accident in a small boat, or when it's snowing and Clayton backs into the, the uh, backyard fence, which yeah. happened. Uh, yeah, or like when Natalie's like uh, shopping. Um, and she just drives over one of those cement middle divider That things. was in high school? You didn't even know me then? It doesn't this matter. Is, this is not it's fair. Part of the That's official, not fair game. It's part of the official record, but, <laughs> but, by, but by... I totally did that. I drove into like an empty planter in my high school. Like it was, there just wasn't a tree into it. So I tried to go forward instead of back. And the whole football team had to lift my car out of the planter. <laughs> Uh, so. <laughs> so there you go. The whole football team comes out to rescue this. They're like, what did you do? Wo this beautiful woman. I don't know. And they're like, let's get our car out of there, boys. Like, let me let's show off the guns. Let's go rescue <laughs> Natalie. Let's lift up the truck. Um, he only knows that story because my sister outed me. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. The, so why why shouldn't the Biden administration just cover all of these accidents now immediately? Um, I seem to remember BP's Deepwater Horizon oil rig disaster being paid for by BP. Right. I seem to remember Exxon Valdez in Alaska, Exxon having to foot that bill. In fact, Exxon had to pay a record amount of money for that disaster, by the way, under the EPA. According to the EPA, it was a record billion dollars back in 1989 when this all happened. So 
This bridge collapse killed six people. Killed six people. Did the Deepwater Horizon, how many people were killed as a result of that? How many people were killed as a result of Exxon Valdez? How many people are suffering as a result of the East Palestine, Ohio train derailment? But the Fed, federal government steps right in to cover this. Six people killed as a result of this. And now they're calling off the investigation or the, the search to find these other individuals uh, in the water um, because the water's so cold. There's no, they, according to them, there's no chance that they would have survived, according to the Coast Guard. So six people dead, enormous environmental uh, concerns with chemicals, vehicles, shipping lane that will now be shut down indefinitely. And the government says, we got this. Nothing to see here. Move along. But that seems to be the least of the oddities, if you can imagine that. Like, that to me stands out as a real bizarre set of circumstances. But the real question is this, as the New York Times asks, why did the ship hit the bridge? It's not known, according to the New York Times, or the Baltimore Sun, or any of the major publications. The National Transportation Safety Board said it is investigating. So we'll have to wait, of course, until we get that official NTSB response. Here's the Baltimore Sun, though, this afternoon. Clayton Diamond, not to be confused with your humble host of Redacted, Clayton Morris. Clayton Diamond, executive director of the American Pilots Association, confirmed that the ship had a complete blackout and lost power to its engine and navigation equipment a few minutes before the collision. It never regained power, Diamond confirmed via email. I spoke to a ship's captain this afternoon. The United States military, who also confirmed that the likelihood of the ship regaining power was uh, when you saw the flickering lights, it's likely the backup diesel generator that kicked on to provide some lights on board. But this was not enough to power the ship. So c confirmation from the, the Pilots Association that power never returned to the ship. Once it was out, the lights you saw flickering there, there was no recovery. There was no shipping. There was no steering power uh, and there was no engine power. So even though you see the lights, that was just to help people see on board. As we reported yesterday, they would have been a Chesapeake Bay Harbor pilot on board directing the ship out of the port, which is standard operating procedure. We now know that there were two on board, in addition to the 20-person crew that was on board. They called a mayday call, of course, after they lost power. Construction workers were able to save a lot of the lives by stopping the flow of traffic across that bridge. So you might say to yourself, why would they call a mayday distress signal and alert the bridge crew and the construction workers to get people off the bridge? Why would they send out a mayday signal if they were trying to kill people? Right? I think that's what our minds, if that's some sort of a terrorist attack, then they're trying to kill people. And they're trying to cause mass casualties, so why would they send a mayday call? If they had no control over the ship and individuals piloting the ship had no control, they were unable to steer, and of course well, they had no power. Well, that's assuming that they were doing it on purpose, not exactly. that something was being done to them. Which we'll get to in a second, right? Because right. if this all comes down, all this comes down to, as j journalist Laura Logan confirmed with intelligence sources today, that this was, in fact, a cyber attack. So they would have called a mayday. They're Americans. They're trying to save people's lives. They would have. Our ship just lost power. What the hell's happening here? Mayday, mayday. We have no control over our ship. So this as... Which is in, it, totally plausible. You know, when you see these hacker competitions, they can hack cars. They can hack elevators in your hotel. They can, I mean, everything is hackable. So I don't know the technology of a ship, but it's not really a stretch to think that they could. I'll bring this up again. But 10 years ago, I did, when I was still at Fox News, I went and did a segment in Pittsburgh who, with a head of security at the time, I forget exactly what organization. But anyway, they were showing that they were able to hack these cars. Every car is now hackable. And so they had Phillips. He refuses to drive a car with any computers. So I got in this car. They hacked the car. And they showed they were sitting in a parking lot while I was driving the car. They hacked the car and they took over control of the car and they drove literally the car into a ditch. And they were sort of laughing about it. And we were, you know, you sure was that wasn't funny. you that drove into the ditch? No, I, I, per and I was actually trying to hold it onto the road and I was scared that they, they almost hit a tree and I could have been. It was we were going fast too. They accelerated and they drove me off the road into a ditch. Mm. And I had no control over the car. 
um, afterwards, I was kind of pissed because like you were literally, I mean, it was almost hitting the tree. Like yeah. you could have killed me. Like anyway, uh, so that was ten years ago. Right. Think about the technology advancements now. Anyway, so this is what Laura Logan confirmed with her intelligence sources inside the Biden administration and outside the Biden administration. This is brilliant, she says. A well-planned strategic attack on one of the most important supply chains in the United States of America. Why are you coming to the microphone telling the country that it's not terrorism, she asked, when your own intelligence agencies are telling you that it is? And she's confirmed this with her own intelligence sources. Listen. And here's the other thing that's concerned me. Why they run to the mic? Had McCabe on this morning on, on, at sunrise on CNN uh -huh. saying it's not terrorism. It's not terrorism. It's uh -huh. not terrorism. It might not be terrorism. But why do you come to the mic right away? These are the type we need facts. We need empirical evidence. We need an investigation. What, what is your I investigation telling you? Well, I have a better question for you, Steve. Why are you coming to the mic telling the country that it's not terrorism when your own intelligence uh, agencies are telling you it is? And I know they are, because I didn't make this up. These are not my words, right? I'm talking to people who are on the inside, some who are on active duty, some who are retired, and everyone, literally, from critical infrastructure in Department of Homeland Security to the intelligence agencies, they know there's no other, it, it's, there, this is a cyber attack on a critical infrastructure corridor for the United States. This is, you know, for those people who think this is just a river, this is in Baltimore, what does this matter? You don't know anything about what you're talking about. This, the I-94 corridor on the eastern seaboard is literally what connects the north and south. And when I talk about hazardous materials, right, this is a brilliant, well-planned strategic attack on one of the most important supply chains in the United States of America. We do know from the NTSB that they have now recovered the black box on board and they're currently analyzing this. So we won't have an official response yet from the NTSB until this black box voyage data is confirmed and analyzed. According to the Baltimore Sun this afternoon, they are going through this information right now. But that's Laura Lugan um, confirming that with her. Go ahead, David. I just have a quick question. Has anyone said how many people were actually on the boat itself? Yeah, there were, there, were, there were 22. There were, tw I think, 22 total. And none of those in individuals were hurt uh, on their way to Sri, okay. Sri Lanka. So none of those individuals were hurt. And you had the two pilots as well, the harbor pilots. Anytime you're leaving one of these ports, uh, you have to have a harbor pilot on board to guide you out. So again, no matter what major port you're in, um, that they know these channels, they know, they know the quays. They know the eddies in the water. They know all of that. And, of course, they're guiding you out. So mm -hmm. two of them um, on board, according to the Baltimore Sun, New York Times, and others. Um, so she goes on to say that this could take three to five years to clear out and fix because it's not just what you're seeing above the water. It's having to literally remove the entire cement pylons because now we don't know how stable they are. How can you just build a new bridge on top of the current cement structures? Watch what you don't see beneath the surface of the water, Steve, is absolutely catastrophic. It is a structural nightmare and a logistical nightmare because you have the entire bottom part, the concrete part of that bridge, and you don't know the extent of the structural damage to that. And you won't know it until you pull all of that infrastructure out of there and you get to look at it. And so you're talking three to five years at best. And what you're talking about here is probably building a new bridge. So what you have effectively done now, you've shut down the I-95 corridor that's above ground. So now you're going to have to go north to New York. You're going to have to go south to North Carolina. And, you're, and your, your trucks, your hazardous materials are going to have to go around Baltimore now. They're not going to be able to go through it. And what else did you do? You shut down the sea corridor, the shipping corridor, because now the port is shut down, right? And so all those tankers that are out at sea that have hazardous materials on them, those are going to have to all be rerouted. And why can you not move hazardous materials through the tunnel? Why is this such a big deal? Because they created that bridge because hazardous materials, for example, oversized loads, they don't fit in the tunnel system. Yep. Yeah. So uh, I was, Laura Logan's going to be on the show here. I was texting her earlier, so she's going to be on the show. We're going to talk to her more about this and get a follow up on this. Um, hopefully she's a, in the, she's traveling at the moment, but hopefully we're going to have her on, uh, tomorrow's show. So we'll, we'll talk to her more about that. However, 
this is devastating. I mean, just where we are now. And someone asked in the chat, like, what does she think? Who who does she think is responsible for this? I mean, that's the that's the major question here. Um, well, it's not her. She says intelligence thinks. So who does intelligence think? Is right. It's not her. She's a reporter. She has intelligence sources inside the Biden administration telling her that this was a cyber attack. Right. And, well, yeah, and I mean, the thing is, though, you, you wouldn't know who was responsible for it if somebody else was responsible for it because they haven't finished the investigation yet. So why the hell are they out saying they know what it's not? You don't know what it's not because you don't know what it is. Exactly. Right. Great point. Yet. So the NTSB just recovered the black box today. And Biden yesterday said there was, no, there was nothing to see here. How do you know? Right. How do you know so quickly? Uh, and I hope that it, there's nothing. But, of course, we already have confirmation now from intelligence sources through through Laura Logan saying that this is, in fact, a cyber attack. So we'll be following the story. I just think something something very fishy is going on here. And there's a lot of questions we don't know the answers to. Someone in the chat just says, Whiplash Magash, says here on Rumble, says, Anyone not addressing the explosions is suspect. We covered that last night on the show. We covered the explosions, the whatever you want to call them, along the top. We showed that video last night on the show um, where the pieces came down. And uh, we, we just showed it to you. You can make your own assessment as to what those were. Many people commented and said it's clearly, you know, electrical transformers break uh, fire as a result of it snapping uh, power, uh, you know, not an explosion. So anyway, totally up to you how you see that. And we don't have any confirmation on that. Uh, but we did show it to you last night, so we definitely covered that I, I guess, on the show. I guess we should be glad that they're not out there just saying it was Russia or China already, you know? Like, they're yeah. about to, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. I, if I, they could. Coming, probably. Give them a minute. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. I mean, it's, yeah, it's all very interesting. Can and, I ask a stupid question? I don't know anything about shipping containers or driving large boats or anything, but um, would tugboats have prevented this? Uh, Do they, you know? Well, n it would have, however, unless one, you hack the tugboats. Well, yeah, but however, according to the harbor masters, the, you wouldn't have used tugs after it had it already was using its own propulsion. Mm -hmm. So you're using the tugs to get it away from the dock. Mm -hmm. But after it's underway, they thought that it was autonomous. That it was. Yeah, fine. and it was because you can see it going on its own. Once it leaves the dock and the tugs are finished, and you're not uh, now you're under your own propulsion. The tugs will leave. Okay. And you're moving at a you're moving at eight knots speed. The tugs are not meant are not going to be used in that purpose to drive you along. That according to the harbor masters uh, that I've researched today on that that exact question, why were they not using tugs at that hour? So, mm -hmm. um, anyway, and, and there's a lot of questions. You know, speaking to a captain this afternoon about this um, from the military, who uh, drives very big ships, very big. Um, saying, you know, there's a lot of questions we still we waiting for the NTSB to come back with their official response. So I, f I find this interesting that according to the NTSB, or according to, uh, you know, captains who have this experience, like they don't want to rush to judgment on this. If they drop the anchor, did it catch or not catch? We know that they did drop an anchor on the port side of the ship. Did it catch or not catch? Was it dragging or did it catch? Um, at which angle was the rudder facing when the power went out? This from a captain I spoke with today. Very, very important, right? Which way was the rudder facing when the power went out? And clearly, we know that the power went out after it had already changed course. We saw that from the track line that we showed you last night on the show. So anyway, we'll hopefully get to the bottom of this. I hope we'll find out some bigger answers here once the NTSB gets us more black box information. Again, we're, uh, hopefully Laura will be on the show tomorrow. And uh, depending on her travel schedule, so that'll be that'll be great. Anyway, we've got more news to get to here on your Wednesday. We're going to talk about the FBI watching what you watch on YouTube and getting your home address because of it. Uh, you might be a little scared by this, and I also want to let you know if you are. We are on Rumble and other platforms. We hope you still watch us on YouTube, but uh, you have options. We're also going to talk about, we're going to talk to Stella Assange about the ruling on Julian Assange's appeal, which was handed down yesterday. And we're going to talk about how the liberal media pitched an absolute fit at the very idea of talking to someone who they don't agree with. Uh, this is why we are screwed as humanity because of this notion that you should not talk to people you don't agree with. That is wrong. That is petulant and that is child childish. 
And that's exactly what NBC News anchors did. But first, we want to tell you about our friends over at Ghost Bed because did you know this was in the newsletter today? Uh, researchers found that just two nights of poor sleep can make people feel up to four years older. You probably did not need a study to tell you that, that you feel like doo-doo if you don't sleep well. Clayton, is this news to you? I feel like I'm 18 years old. Because you I, slept so well last I sleep, night? I sleep fantastic. All right. Well, we want to tell you about Ghost Bed because they have an award-winning adjustable base and you can get the ultimate sleep experience. They're a family-owned business and sleep experts with 20-plus years of experience and 60,000 five-star reviews by sleepyheads who know what they're talking about. There's a patented cooling technology exclusive to Ghost Bed mattresses for comfort and support that you cannot find anywhere else. They have premium durable materials and it's handcrafted and made in North America that's in the USA and Canada so you can get a 101 night at home sleep trial on all mattresses and pillows so uh, give it a try head on over to ghostbed.com slash redacted if you use our code redacted you get 50% off so you don't have to feel like an old geezer because you're not sleeping well try out ghostbed and see if you can Feel like a spring chicken. What? What? Oh, it's ghostbed.com slash redacted. A couple of comments here just real quick in the chat. Some people saying, uh, some saying not true on the tugboats question. Um, let's see, where was it? Uh, here on Rumble. Not true. Tugs can take you in and out. Fact. Fly dog. I didn't say that. I said what, what, what the harbor masters in Chesapeake Bay have said is that once it's underway, they allow under your own propulsion to continue. That's what. That's according to yeah, I mean, uh, it, yeah. It was technically out at that point. Yeah, it was out and almost out, literally almost out to sea fully. So I think that's the point. I I think tugboats can operate up to like 15 knots um, in speed. So yes, even if it was going at eight knots, it could have continued at 15 knots. And I, I know that they can go for long, long distances, and um, so all of that. So just to be clear, we hear you. But uh, that's not the point I was making. I just want to be clear about that. Someone else in the chat says, Key Norup says in Rumble says, do we trust the NTSB? That's a great question. I mean, if the NTSB is literally like looking into, uh, you know, into Boeing um, mm -hmm. and those disasters, and do we trust who, you know, who works at the NTSB? How, how, uh, uh, how tied? Pete, uh, Pete Buttigieg still in charge? Um, he, if, if so, no. He's the transportation answers. secretary, but but the NTSB, of oh. course, what, what relationship do they have to like, right. Boeing and these these aircraft companies and, and all of this and sort of cozy relationship I mean, there? I've, do they act independently I've or come, not? I've come to trust no government organization at this point. <laughs> yeah. I mean, until you know, until you you get a, the information and you can kind of analyze it. I, I trust independent analyzers and, and journalists before I trust anything our government says or does. Yeah, that's true. Can you name one government department that you trust? You got to give me a minute on that. CIA. No. Nope. FBI. Oh, wait till you get to the next next story. No. IRS. No. No, no. Post, oh, o post office maybe that app that picks up illegal immigrants in south america that seems to be pretty reliable the cb1 app the for them the customs and border Pat the, patrol i trust those San guys Francisco poop app a government app because i kind of trust that one but no <laughs> that's I not don't a government think it app is. sorry <laughs> all right all right well the fbi is watching what you watch on youtube and they can ask google to hand over your personal information that means your name your email address, your address, your home address, your phone number. They have been doing this. I know this is not shocking, but it's still upsetting. This was reported last week by Forbes. They say that federal investigators have ordered Google to provide information on all viewers of select YouTube videos. Now, you may not have watched any of these YouTube videos, but it's the precedence that matters here, right? Because you watch things, whether you think you do or not, that the algorithm serves to you, and then you make a decision. So here is what has happened. Uh, in a just unsealed Kentucky uh, case reviewed by 
Forbes, undercover cops sought to identify the individual behind the online moniker Elon Musk WHM, who they suspect of buying Bitcoin for cash. So that was the reason they were after this channel. Now, in conversations with the user in early January, undercover agents said link, sent links of YouTube tutorials for mapping via drones and augmented reality software. Then they asked Google for information on who had viewed the videos which had been viewed over 30,000 times. Now the court order shows that the government is telling Google to provide them with names, addresses, telephone numbers, and user activity for all Google account users who access the YouTube videos in January of 2023. The government also wanted IP addresses of non-Google account owners who viewed the video, and they argued there's reason to believe that these records would be relevant and materials to an ongoing criminal investigation, including by providing identification information about the perpetrators. Uh, okay, so that's a lot, right? You just stumble upon a video, now the government knows where you live, and they're watching you. They want your IP address, and even if you were watching anonymously, they want you unveiled, unmasked. And did Google do it? Well, Forbes cannot confirm if they did or not, but the court did grant the request. In another case, the feds found a live stream of a guy in New Hampshire that had made a bomb and requested that Google provide a list of accounts that viewed and or interacted with the live streams and the associated identifying information during specific time frames. So like the Twitter files, we see the government getting increasingly comfortable asking for this information behind social networks, right? Right? Mm -hmm. It's not, uh, the, make anybody else nervous? You yeah. don't like it? You like it? <laughs> no. Okay. Well, like Anthony Goodley says in the chat here um, on Rumble, the Fed setting up a honeypot then asking YouTube for user data of those who watched it is such BS. So was it a honeypot video, this particular, um, like they were they were putting well, this out there or they were using it as a, a catch-all? They did, they did send it out on their own. They weren't actually the ones doing it, but they, uh, you know, they sent out the link and then saw who was going to interact with them. Now, Forbes spoke to privacy experts who said this is concerning and here is why. They said this is unconstitutional because it un uh, undoes protections of the First and Fourth Amendments covering free speech and freedom from unreasonable searches. This person here says this is the latest chapter in a disturbing trend where we see government agencies increasingly transforming search warrants into digital dragnets. It's unconstitutional, it's terrifying, and it happens every day. He says no one should fear a knock at the door from police simply because of what the YouTube algorithm serves up. I'm horrified that the courts are allowing it. I am too. He said, this is just chilling. Um, and this person at the bottom, another privacy expert says, what we watch online can reveal deeply sensitive information about us, our politics, our passions, our religious beliefs, and much more. It is fair to expect that law enforcement won't have access to that information without probable cause. This order turns this assumption on this head. So the court's are allowing it. Google, I mean, you can't you can't blame the feds for asking, right? They want something, they ask. You can blame a judge for allowing it, and that's exactly what our judicial system is doing. And yeah, it's scary to think you could be surveyed just by what the algorithm shows you, but again, we should not be surprised by this and we should not be surprised that they think Google will be their patsy for this because as former State Department cyber expert Michael Benz recently pointed out on Tucker Carlson's show, Google was basically started by the CIA. Google is a great example of this. Google began as a DARPA grant uh, by Larry Page and Sergey Brin when they were Stanford PhDs. And they, they got their funding as part of a joint CIA NSA program to chart how, quote, birds of a feather flock together online through search engine aggregation. And then one year later, they launched Google and then became a military contractor quickly. Thereafter, they got Google Maps by purchasing a CIA satellite software, essentially. Uh, and the ability to track, to use free speech on the internet as a way to circumvent state control over media over in places like Central Asia or, or all around the world was seen as a way to be able to do what used to be done out of CIA station houses or out of embassies or consulates in a way that, that was 
totally turbocharged. And all of the internet free speech technology was initially created by our national security state. VPNs, virtual private networks to hide your, your IP address. Tor, the dark web, to be able to buy and trail, uh, sell goods anonymously. End-to-end -end encrypted chats. All of these things were created initially as DARPA projects or as joint CIA-NSA projects to be able to help intelligence-backed groups to overthrow governments that were causing a problem uh, to the Clinton administration or the Bush administration or the Obama administration. And this plan worked magically from about 1991 until about 2014 uh, when there began to be an about face on internet freedom and its utility. Okay, Jake Weber in our YouTube chat says, everybody turn off redacted. Now, I can see <laughs> that by doing this story, we are shooting ourselves in the foot a little. Look at the... <laughs> Look at our views. Once we started to talk about how uh, the FBI can track you <laughs> based on your YouTube views, the so views I'm went up. By the way, no, yeah. look. So people are like, "F you" to the uh, to the uh, the feds. They're like, "We're watching Redacted." So our we can see on a chat. <laughs> we had like a little bit <clears throat> of dip, see, and then people are like, Ooh. <laughs> "We can see, yeah, we can see on a chart here." People, well, after yeah, but now it's like going up steadily as we're talking about this. So thank you for giving the middle finger for you know. sticking with us. Yeah. yeah, I mean, and if they come to your house, I want to know about it. If they're saying, "Hey, you're watching Redacted," what do you think? Are you anti-government? And you can say, I am a non-pacifist peace extremist. That's so, exactly yes, right. That's exactly what you should say. Uh, again, so is it any wonder that Google would hand over data to the government when they are a tool of the government? Let us know what you think of this. Uh, we've got more news to get to. I just oh, like ahead. the idea. Oh, I, just, I just like the idea that the thought of like an FBI agent, like like learning how to build like old school, like wagon coaches and stuff like that by watching my YouTube streams is um as I'm watching, they'll, they'll know something about pottery and art restoration. Mm -hmm. That's basically yeah. all I watch. So I just, I just, oh. I just feel good for that. That FBI agent is probably that's going to get you a knock. I know. I was like, I was thinking about it today. I was like, oh, they're going to watch my stuff that I watch on video games and uh, playing guitar and uh, you know, and and all of the craziness that we watch here on Redacted. How to clean crayon off of a wall. That's <laughs> right. the types of things that I look up. Uh, today I was helping my son or my kids play because they had a, they're off school and I was helping them uh, play Settlers of Catan, the board game, mm -hmm. and. Uh, I'm like, you need to watch. All right, watch this so you can better understand how to use your resources when you're playing the game. And like, so, right. you know, it's a good Well, YouTube I mean, video. you know the profile, right, that they're looking up is people who are homesteading, yeah. people who like chickens, people who like meat, people guns. who like guns. People are watching right? guns That's, videos. They want to know what you're up to if Preppers. you are that kind of person. Yeah. Well, thank you guys for liking. Smash that like button if you would, because when you actually hit that like button, it pushes us further out in the YouTube algorithm. It does. It actually, it's amazing. We can actually watch the numbers dramatically increase when you do that so if you're watching us on a tv you can actually swipe over with your remote and hit the little thumbs up button if you're watching us on mobile right now you can do the same thing actually let us know how you're watching us you're watching us on a computer screen do you watch us on a tv i can see the numbers actually more and more of you are now sitting back and actually enjoying us watching us on a television mm. um which is which is a, a big big change for youtube over the years and rumble and rumble's app now rumble's app on the apple tv works great so i watch a lot of rumble content on my tv using the rumble app yeah so let us know how you're watching us on rumble as well um did they have a new x app out available on different platforms remember back in the day they used to have twitter apps available like on apple tv and stuff like that but i don't know that they still do that do you know anything about that david i i don't think they do yet no they, their api isn't even set up to you know mm. post longer videos uh anyway so all right. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. Well, we have more news to get to. Before we do, who called me Velma? A couple of in people. The in the, a couple of people in the chat think that you look like uh, Velma from Scooby Doo. Because I'm wearing orange. Yeah. Tonight. Sha and shaggy in the, the chat. Shaggy in the chat thinks you're. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's better, I guess, than the time I got called Lilith from Frasier. Oh yeah. When I wear a bun. Yeah, that's right. You just, you just gotta, you gotta say Jinkies, guys. Jinkies. <laughs> there you go. that is with the orange that's right all right thanks shaggy um uh someone in the chat says thank you for the super chat says the baltimore attack was an attack on the american flag well if you think about it yeah a lot of people have not really talked about francis scott key um uh francis scott key of course who wrote the star-spangled banner right right so um yeah that's 
that's the name of the bridge, the Francis Scott Key Bridge. So it is an attack on an American symbol, right? In that way. I think it's crazy. We talked about the Salvador Sal, Salvador Dali. The boat is named the Dali. And he painted famously a broken bridge painting. Like, oh, I didn't that is, know that. Uh, It's unbelievable to me. It's like... It's, it's a synchronicity. Crazy. All right. We've got more. Yeah. Stella Assange is going to join us here in a moment. We're going to get an update on how things stand with Julian Assange. Of course, her husband, she is a lawyer for Julian Assange. And it's just been an absolutely trying four years um, dealing with all of the craziness of the American judicial system and the UK judicial system um, and trying to get him extradited to the United States. So Stella is going to join us here in just a few moments. Uh, but first, we want to tell you about our friends over at Stamps.com because, look, you know, hey, the 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 smell, the excitement of the New Year's has worn off. It's time to start finding your groove and keep things going, especially when it comes to running a small business. You know, all the shipping that you had to do during the Christmas holiday season, things kind of go down and flat in, fe in January, February. Well, guess things are picking back up. Hopefully things are picking back up again. And Stamps.com helps streamline all of your mailing and shipping to turbocharge your operational efficiencies. And Stamps.com has its, it's like a post office in your pocket and right in your home office. You don't need to go and wait in line at the post office ever again. Postage rates just increased again. Glad we're sending $800 billion to Ukraine, but we're paying now more for postage. Uh, sorry, not 800 billion. That's how much our defense budget is. But we sent 100 billion. Luckily, stamps.com has the best discounts in the industry with rates you can't find anywhere else, like up to 89% off of USPS postage and the UPS as well. Plus, stamps.com automatically tells you your cheapest and fastest shipping options so you don't have to navigate all of the different carriers. And you can do it all right from your website, from their website at home. Go to stamps.com, print postage wherever you do business. All you need is a computer and a printer. They even send you a free scale. You get a free digital scale. You'll have everything you need right from home. You can print everything out, and they'll even come and pick it up. You don't need to go anywhere. <laughs> Keep your mailing and shipping moving at the speed of your business with Stamps.com. Sign up right now. Use the promo code REDACTED for a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage and a free digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to Stamps.com. Click the microphone icon at the top part of the page and enter the code REDACTED. We'll have a link in the description as well. So go to stamps.com uh, and use the promo code REDACTED. Well, it's been a whirlwind week in London as we've been awaiting for, we've been waiting years to find out what will happen to Julian Assange. Will he be sent to the United States? We hope that's not the case. Will he be able to uh, delay this extradition? to win, go through with the appeal process. Well, we just, of course, on Tuesday, got word from the UK judge that they will be able to move forward with some version of an appeal. It's quite a messy situation, of course, trying to unpack everything that's been happening over the past 24 hours. Stella Assange, Julian Assange's wife, uh, has just been in the middle of a whirlwind dealing with all of this, and she's been kind enough to join us here on Redacted with an update. So Stella, thank you so much for joining us here on the show. We really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. So you received this over 60 page uh, document from the court. Uh, what was your initial immediate response? Did you feel like that this was a major victory, a small victory, a step back? Where was your head as soon as you got your hands and your team got your hands on this document? Well, it certainly wasn't anything we could have anticipated. Uh, we were expecting either a denial of appeal or uh, uh, allowing Julian to have his uh, arguments heard. And instead, we have this kind of uh, midway situation where the U.S. government has given yet another opportunity to shift, to uh, adjust its arguments. Uh, before Julian can uh, have an appeal on these three points. Uh, it's strange. It's weird. Uh, the UK courts, um, the US government has had two days to be able to um, give its arguments, and the, and the judges made specific questions on these points during that hearing. And the lawyers for the U.S. were not able to satisfy the judges. And so the judges have instead now given the U.S. government, so um, given a 
an opportunity for a political fix, basically, in relation to these uh, three points. So the next step is that the US government has until the 16th of April to submit so-called diplomatic assurances, uh, which are problematic, of course, because um, assurances are not enforceable. Uh, they are a submission between the US executive and the UK executive sort of built on trust. And of course, in this case, we know the US government is not trustworthy. It is the government that in fact plotted, uh, or it is the US um, that plotted to assassinate Julian during the Trump administration. And Julian would never be safe to be in the United States. So the whole the whole case is moot, given given where it's come from. There were a couple of key moments, though, in this document, or key points in this document, that I thought they they, they basically threw out this CIA argument, did they not? So the the Mike Pompeo piece of this, the CIA targeting Julian Assange, it seems that the court is now saying that's not relevant in this particular document and in this particular case for the appeal. Also, the the fact that he was being targeted as, as uh, politically, that this was politically motivated, is also removed from this. Is that, I mean, did those two things strike you as odd? And how do you, how do you get these assurances in from the United States if you remove this key piece of evidence here, which is the targeting of Julian by the CIA for assassination? Well, look, this paragraph specifically, 210, 210 in the judgment is absolutely mind-blowing. What the court is saying is, um, yes, the United States, uh, the evidence uh, that, that Julian is presenting may prove that the United States plotted to kidnap and assassinate Julian, but given that the United States is now attempted or is now seeking to extradite him, i.e., uh, given that the U.S. is now seeking legal means to uh, to get its hands on him, then uh, the assassination plot and the kidnap plot is no longer relevant because they'll get him legally. This is, of course, completely absurd. And um, you know, the, the the any logical person uh, would uh, look at this and say, well, if they've been engaging in illegal acts, um, assassination plots, kidnap plots against uh, Julian in the past, then surely they're not trustworthy um, in, in an extradition context either. Um, and who's, who's uh, to say that the purpose of an extradition is not to assassinate him? Um, you know, this is, right. there, are, there are so many leaps of logic here. But the reality is that the British courts, if they do accept that there's an, if they do accept the evidence that there there has been an assassination plot against him, i.e., to say that it is relevant, then they can't extradite him. If they do accept that this case is politically motivated, then they can't extradite it, extradite him. So, uh, they've really been tying themselves in knots in order to find um, a way to pass the buck to the United States um, to allow them to, to, to make a political um, intervention, to make it easier, more passable, uh, more palatable to extradite him. Uh, so I don't, I don't feel reassured at all because what we know is that the British courts have accepted so-called assurances in the past in relation even in relation to Julian, which are anything but assurances, uh, conditional assurances, um, very carefully worded assurances that actually don't assure anything, don't don't um, make Julian safer or or um, uh, protect his rights in any way. Um, what it is is political cover for the British courts to be able to proceed, and I think this is this is the real reading anyone should have when they when they see um a invitation uh to issue assurances it, it is it sends alarm bells ringing frankly the three grounds that they give julian to 
uh, uh, move towards appeal. What were those three grounds, and and are you confident you'll be able to to show to prove that to the court? Well, one was in relation to the death penalty. So this was specifically that the British Home Secretary had not asked and the U.S. government had not issued any assurance that the death penalty would not be applied. So there is the possibility that once he's on U.S. soil, on the same, um, on the same um, facts alleged in the, in the uh, indictment, the U.S. could then seek to charge him under a different um, part of the Espionage Act, which carries the death penalty. And there's nothing uh, to stop them from doing that. So that was a, an acknowledgement by the courts that this is a real possibility and disturbing, a very disturbing um, prospect. So the courts have asked the U.S. to issue an assurance in relation to that. The second one concerned um, the... Uh, First Amendment, uh, it's connected to the third, really, but the Espionage Act, of course, doesn't allow a public interest defense, and it's never really been tested uh, in relation to a publisher. This case is unprecedented in the in the um, in respect of of uh, because it has been applied to a publisher for the very first time in history. Previously, the Espionage Act has been applied to whistleblowers, to sources. Um, to the source of the information, but not the one who publishes that information. So just uh, to remind everyone, Julian published information that Chelsea Manning sent to him. Uh, so he was he was doing the job of a journalist. And uh, the U.S. has argued under oath in its submissions to the extradition uh, case here in the U.K. that because Julian is an Australian citizen and because he was not on U.S. soil, that he does not enjoy constitutional protections. He is not entitled to the First Amendment. This is something that Pompeo also said in, on numerous occasions in his speeches. Uh, so the UK courts have said that the US um, must assure uh, the courts that Julian is entitled to the First Amendment. So basically acknowledging um, that he is a, a journalist and, and uh, that he is able to invoke those protections in case of trial, and uh, that he won't be discriminated against on the basis of his nationality. Hmm. Uh, this is a, a direct contradiction. What the British courts are asking the US to do is to contradict their own prosecutors' submissions to the courts. So it's a very strange uh, position for the US government to be in right now. And the US government never lies. So uh sure they won't have a problem with that. Getting these assurances uh, will be 100% accurate and truthful, and they can stand by those stand by those statements. What did Julian think of this? Uh, um, what did Julian think of this document today, this this order from the court when in your discussions with him today, what did he did he f find it favorable, positive? What was his overall mood? Look, I've barely been able to speak to Julian about the decision. Uh, our conversations are limited to 10 minutes at a time. Uh, he learned of the decision at the same time as the rest of us. Uh, he was only able to read the decision uh, this evening because uh, his lawyer, Jennifer Robinson, happened to have a visit booked in this afternoon and was able to bring the decision to him. So. I haven't actually been able to discuss it with Julian. Um, but, you know, this is the little conversation I was able to have with him was, you know, this was a, a completely um, bizarre turn of events um, and one that you have to, you come to expect this kind of strange behavior by the courts uh, when you're dealing with a political case like this one obviously is. Yeah. Well, please give our love, our audience here, the, the millions of folks that watch our show, please give our love and prayers to Julian. And we are 100% behind you in this fight. And if there's anything that our, our audience could ever do, please let us know. But uh, Stella, we appreciate you taking a few moments out of your day, an absolutely whirlwind past 24 hours, I'm sure for you. So thank you so much. Give our love to Julian and, uh, We'll keep fighting.
Thanks, Stella. Thanks, Clayton. Thanks so much. <clears throat> okay, I screamed out loud during uh, that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, yeah. So, the uh, so thoughts thoughts about this? I mean, I mean, I, I saw I saw you. I saw your face under the uh, under the lights here. I was like, okay, wait, wait. I, I'm just like, so there. the The argument is, okay, United States. Yes, you tried to kill him. Can you just promise us that you won't do that again? And that's you tried to that's what we're doing. Yeah, right. You you tried to assassinate him. The head of the CIA tried to have him killed. Can you can you just promise us you won't do that? Don't again? do that again. That's how I literally talk to my seven year old. Like, don't, don't yell at mommy like that. Okay. All right. Well, that, that, that. The, the judge, like, even, even the fact that the judge is like, well, we see no reason to, uh, cause it, it was, uh, uh, yesterday, um, uh, what was the guy's name? Um, I can't think of the guy, the, the guy we had on yesterday. Uh, oh, Richard Medhurst? But we're, yeah, Richard Medhurst. Thank you. Uh, where like in, in, in his piece yesterday, like you see this thing with the judge where like the judge was like, yeah, but we don't see any reason to believe that the that the United States is being like un untruthful about this. It's like, yeah, yeah, we do. <laughs> you know? Right. Like, like, oh. So murderers tell the truth. They right. Think. So let's just go they back have, to the murderers. They have some credibility yeah. here and we're going to believe them. And the argument and I, is literally that, well, we did try to kill him, but this time we're using the courts. But that the, the try to kill him part could have succeeded, and then you would need the courts. So the court was plan B. Right. No, Killing like, was plan A. We did try to kill him in Ecuador, but it didn't work out. So now we're having to rely on you guys, the courts. But we promise we will not kill him again. This is absurd. I just... It, it's it's yeah, I, almost... I just, it's not funny, but that's why I'm just laughing, because it's so stinking ridiculous. Go ahead, Philip. I'm sorry. I just... Uh, the thing I've never been able to wrap my head around, and I, I bring this up almost every time we, we talk about Julian Assange, he is not a U.S. citizen. Mm. Like, how the hell does he, do, do, can we do this? Like, if, if it's an international thing, shouldn't it be, to, uh, like, handled by the ICC? But, of course, the United States doesn't want to be a part of the ICC mm -hmm. because we, we have too many war criminals in our government. So it's like, they, so how, how does this work? How do you take an Australian citizen, extradite them to the United States for trial in, in, in the United States? Well, you have a spineless, we? like, you have, well, you have a, first of all, you have a spineless you have, a, you have a spineless Australia and you have a spineless UK, and they're both under the thumb of the United States. You want your you want your nuclear submarines, you want your AUKUS relationship and nuclear submarines in Australia that we're going to give you, then you better step back and let us handle Julian Assange. Don't stick your you and don't tell us how to run things here in the United States is basically the response. And the UK government, of course, they're totally under our thumb. They are simply toadies for the United States. But the court ruling says you have to assure him First Amendment rights, which is a contradiction because then he would not be in trial at all if he had First Amendment rights. Right. It, it makes no sense. Uh, UK, you're drunk. You need to go home. Let this guy free. But, uh, be but done I mean, with this. And I, I, I do kind of agree with her that like the 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 the, the trickiness of this is if, if they're saying no, we'll, we'll we'll guarantee him First Amendment rights. You know, we'll treat him as a citizen. Then he gets here, and then and then it's not just espionage. Then it's actually treason. They'll be like, no, now we're tying him for treason because we're treating him like a citizen. And An then American the death citizen penalty comes out. Yeah, treason. Yeah. death penalty as a result. Exactly. Yeah. So it is a incredibly. <laughs> She, she described it accurately, that they're, they're literally putting themselves in knots and contorting themselves um, in this to try to basically do whatever they can for the United States government in this. So let us know your thoughts on this. Thank you, Stella, for joining us. Uh, she's just been nonstop um, and uh, like no sleep. So thank you for taking a few minutes out to be with us. We appreciate it. If I can, um, if I can throw one more bit in this, but yeah. what, what, does the US, what does the U.S. gain from this? And that's the thing. Like, what what do we gain from trying Julian Assange? Nothing at all. It's just revenge. It's just it, revenge. It's revenge, and it's also bully status. Well, preventative, right? It's the idea that well, then no journalist will ever try to do this again. Right. Right. They'll try, you know, not want to get information from the government and expose the government. I mean, this is this is what journalists are supposed to do. Going back to the Pentagon Papers, and I mean, this is what you do. Mm -hmm. um, this is how you keep your government honest. And uh, yeah, because it'd be it'd be different if what the, if what the U.S. government was trying to do was prove that that what was released was untrue. But that's not it because they they, they know it was. No, yeah. so they're so, not trying to prove innocence. No, so, so their argument yeah, has punishment. been yeah, their argument has been well, 
he put uh, he put agents' lives at risk. He put undercover or members of the U.S. military their lives at risk by exposing this information, which is not true. And as Richard Medhurst yesterday said on our show, who cares? These literally they were, they're war criminals. Who so we're we're worried about we're worried about their well being. And but nothing happened to these individuals. There's been there's been no reprisal. There's been no problems with any of the stuff that's been outed as a result of Julian. There's, they've managed to show zero evidence that anyone has been harmed as a result of it. And in fact, Joe Biden said as much. He said exactly that that it was the damage was basically zero. So back Th that so we, was a quote from Joe Biden. So we circle back to Philip's point. What do we get from this? Right. Like what do we? Well, get I mean, it's not good for it. It may be good for the government because they can bully journalists, but it's not good for us because we can't speak freely. We can't report stories and we can't know the truth. So it's a net loss for regular people, but it would be a win for people in power. Uh, so anyhow, well, we have more news to get to. We're going to talk about how the mainstream media are whiny babies. And they cannot talk to people they don't agree with, how that's dividing us even further. And how NBC had an absolute meltdown. And, and Rachel Maddow, wait until you see this. Uh, it's, it's unbelievable. So it's not just about being whiny. They are petulant. And they are literally having meltdowns on television. We're going to show you this. But first, we want to tell you about our friends over at Genyacel. Because if you have three minutes in the morning or just maybe 30 minutes, you can keep your face looking younger and wrinkle free with Gen 90. That's the new instant wrinkle treatment from Genucel. Gen 90 instantly reduces the appearance of wrinkles anywhere you use it around the eyes, the forehead, crow's feet, laugh lines, even on your chin. And it starts working in seconds so you can feel more confident than ever. Gen 90 uses a luxurious para paraben free, silky smooth. And best of all, it's working in seconds. Uh, that's a reason why why Genucel has 400% the customer loyalty of other skincare brands. And right now you can also get Genucel XV. Uh, that is the collagen builder moisturizer with vitamin C and hydraulic acid in a pure natural base for stunning results every day. So Gen 90 and XV are on sale right now during their spring sale, included in the bestseller package along with Genucel's under eye bags and puffiness serum. So safe, it's safer than harsh products that come from overseas cost hundreds of dollars try gen 90 now and see your fine lines and wrinkles disappear now you can order at genucel.com slash redacted and when you do you get a free spa box with two luxury skincare essentials plus free shipping so you see the link right there below that's genucel.com slash redacted one more time genucel.com slash redacted well, the media wants to divide us, and one of the main reasons uh, is because when we are divided, they are better off. They are whiny, petulant, malcontented divas, and that is never more apparent than the fit that NBC pitched when the anchors were asked to work with somebody that they did not agree with. So here's the story. NBC News hired former head of the Republican National Committee, Ronna McDaniel, to be a talking head on the network. NBC, you probably know this, is an illiberal extension of the Biden administration, and McDaniels is obviously a Republican. So the network executives probably thought that she could bring a balanced viewpoint to their airwaves, but then all major marquee NBC talent pitched an absolute tissy fit because they do not want balance at all. Did you say tissy fit? Hissy fit. Sorry. Okay. They had a hissy fit. I don't know if this was a new version of a hissy fit. No. Sorry. That's not a thing. But it sounds like a thing. It's an it onomatopoeia. It changed genders or something. You're I didn't up know. up in a tiss. Yeah. Tissy. Hissy. Tissy. Have a tiff. Okay. Tissy. Anyway, they flipped out. They lost mm -hmm. their shit. Yeah. Is basically what I'm saying. Uh, so here's a list of those who could not even think of working with someone they don't agree with. Mika Brzezinski, Joe Scarborough, Rachel Maddow, Chuck Todd, Joy Reid, Nicole Wallace, and Lawrence O'Donnell. Here is Rachel Maddow thinking she's being so brave by speaking out about Ronna McDaniels on the network because Ronna McDaniels, she says, enabled Trump to get farther than he otherwise would have, which shows she has a lack of understanding of why people vote and she does not even care she thinks without Ronda McDaniels, Trump couldn't have made it this far. And that's 
that's she's taking that to the bank. This is two minutes. I apologize because she's obnoxious, but I do want to hear from people I don't agree with. And so we're going to listen to what she has to say, even though we don't want to. A free and uncowed press is part of our system of government. We stand up for ourselves as a way of standing up for our country and for our Constitution, the First Amendment to which makes it possible for us to exist at all. And so I want to associate myself with all my colleagues, both at MSNBC and at NBC News, who have voiced loud and principled objections to our company putting on the payroll someone who hasn't just attacked us as journalists, um, but someone who is part of an ongoing project to get rid of our system of government. Someone who still is trying to convince Americans that this election stuff, it doesn't really work, that this last election, it wasn't a real result, that American elections are fraudulent. Because that argument, that is a necessary part, that is the most necessary part of the overall project of getting us as Americans to give up on this election stuff. Because wouldn't we rather have a real man in charge anyway, somebody who could really get some stuff done, if only we could clear away all the things in his way. We have a long history in this country of forgettable men telling us that we need a new system of government where everything's under their control and politics is over and this new strongman way of government is going to make America great again. We have had a lot of these guys. But our generation's version of this guy has gotten a lot farther than all the rest of them. And why is that? He, he would have been as forgotten as all the rest of them had he not been able to attach himself to an institution like the Republican Party and had the leader of that party in his time not decided that she wouldn't just abide him, she would help. She would help with the worst of it. Okay. She's so melodramatic. Uh, yes. She's she really mean... feels this and she slid right into the superior attitude, which is so funny because Rachel Maddow, girl, I watched you for the whole of the Trump administration, and you told me that that election was evidence that elections don't work. You told me that those elections were interfered with and that that was an illegitimate election that could possibly be overturned. So how come you can say it and Ronna McDaniels cannot? So you're telling me this is just about democracy, right? Her logic is flawed here because she's saying a free press is essential to democracy, but this lady, Ronna McDaniels, is not free to say what she wants on her airwaves, on her press. Can anyone follow that logic? It's a very bad faith argument. Well, and she also, of course, is the same person who is talking about the first, you know, freedom of speech and how we're, we're really, we're stewards of that. And she's the person who, cuts away from a Trump speech on a regular basis to tell us that she's protecting us from speech. Right. Yeah. Free press, but only the way I curate it. Right. Now, she can't even talk to Ron McDaniels, doesn't even want to share the air with her because maybe she would learn something. Maybe she could ask a relevant question. She can't come down from her high tower and see why Trump might appeal to some people. Whether I've never listened to Ron McDaniels. I sort of see her peripherally. But it doesn't influence how I feel. Maybe, though, by talking to her, you might be able to say, OK, what is it you see here? And if she is actually talking about these elections and saying there are problematic things that happened in these elections, maybe NBC would want to investigate that, ask some questions, right, and say, OK, I don't think. And even if they did, even if they said, OK, what is what is your whole shtick about the elections? Can you explain it to me? And she said crazy things. They could at least interact with that. Right. But they cannot even interact with it. Now, here she is now because she says she can't even she can't talk to this lady. So we sent her packing and here she is gloating about it. MSNBC's leadership did not object to Ronna McDaniel being hired by NBC News when the matter first arose. But when the hiring was announced and MSNBC staff essentially unanimously and instantly expressed outrage, 
our leadership at MSNBC heard us, understood, and adjusted course. We were told this weekend in clear terms, Ronna McDaniel will not be on our air. <coughs> Ronna McDaniel will not be on MSNBC. And I say that and give you that level of detail because there has been an effort since by other parts of the company to muddy that up in the press and make it seem like that's not what happened at MSNBC. I can assure you that is what happened at MSNBC. Ronna McDaniel will not appear on MSNBC. So says our boss since Saturday, and it has never been anything other than clear. And I will also say, you know, if, if you care what I think about this, I will tell you the fact that Ms. McDaniel is on the payroll at NBC News, to me, that is inexplicable. I mean, you wouldn't, you wouldn't, you wouldn't hire a, like a, a wise guy. You wouldn't hire a made man, like a mobster, to work at a DA's office, right? <laughs> you, you wouldn't hire a pickpocket to work as a TSA screener. And so I, I find the decision to put her on the payroll ex inexplicable. And I, and I hope they will reverse their decision. And it's not about, you know, Democratic Party, Republican Party. It's not about partisanship. It's not about right versus left. It's not about being a political professional versus some other kinds of person. It's not about being mean or nice to journalists. It's not about just being associated with Donald Trump and his time in the Republican Party. It's not even about lying or not lying. It's about our system of government and undermining elections and going after democracy. She's a liar. She did that during the 2016 elections. Yes, she did. She's lying. She's saying we can't have somebody who beat a drum about democracy not working. I did that from 2016 to 2020, but we can't have anybody else yeah, doing Russia it. Yeah, Russia, Russia, you know, and every night on her show, Russia with her neck, Russia. And so she's gloating that she's gloating that MSNBC would never have this person on her air, right? We're not going to have we're not going to have her on our air, but I can't believe that the balls of NBC would keep her on the payroll over there. And she's basically saying right out loud that this I mean, to me, this is like a lawsuit waiting. to This happen. is exactly what I'm getting at is you now. I don't know if this would qualify as tort. You've interfered with someone else's business on purpose. Why would you do that? Right. Was it right? Tor tortious interference like she presumably had an L, I mean, she, Ronna McDonald's. It doesn't matter doesn't if, you, matter. if you're incorporated or not. What it, it oh, matters okay. yeah, yeah. that you have interfered with somebody else's money making opportunity, right? right? You've taken somebody else's business and tanked it for, for nefarious reasons. And just at the heart of it, though, what, what's so problematic about having someone on your air that you might disagree with? Because well, I want to get to that. You're, yeah. It's an echo chamber at MSNBC. First of all, no one's watching MSNBC anyway, but it's an echo chamber where you just have a whole bunch of Biden sycophants. I mean, you have literally, what's her name? Uh, the former press secretary. Um, Jen, Red, Psaki. Jen Psaki. Joe Scarborough, Miko Brzezinski. I mean, all of these like Washington insider people that are right. working there. So to have somebody who's on a conservative that might have a difference of opinion about that. But hold on. She also said, I couldn't imagine on our air having someone on our air that's like having a wise guy on our air the, to get, you know, to have that person commenting about the DA or in the DA's office. They a have, mobster. She A mobster. Yeah. She's literally comparing him to a mob. You have people who on your air, who are like former CIA. You have people on your air who are former members of the Pentagon that are now on your payroll, literally paying them. It's just like Operation Paperclip, uh, excuse me, Operation Mockingbird, like right out in the open where you have these individuals yeah. on the payroll of MSNBC that there's no more hiding the deep state. They have bomb makers, people who literally kill people with bombs, right? right? And we, but we can't listen to this that we don't like this speech. Uh, and you're right, they are the biggest hypocrites because they too have interfered with our democracy by, oh, I don't know, burying the Hunter Biden laptop story, surfacing the Stormy Daniels story while burying the Tara Reid story. Maddow sold us Russiagate like a used car salesman. They lied about COVID through their teeth, infection rates, dead uh, masks, vaccines. Uh, January 6th, I could go on. They 
skew every narrative to fit their agenda and they never apologize. But instead of reaching out to learn something from someone they don't like, who I don't know why she would want to be on NBC. You know, maybe it was brave of her to do that, Ronna McDaniel, but instead they cancel her. And NBC responded saying, our anchors are right and that we need a new, uh, more cohesive and aligned newsroom. Here's the statement. After listening to the legitimate concerns of many of you, I have decided that Ronna McDaniel will not be an NBC News contributor. No organization, particularly a newsroom, can succeed unless it is cohesive and aligned. We don't need diversity of thought. We can't have that, is what they're admitting here blatantly. Over the last few days, it has become clear that this appointment undermines our goal to be cohesive and aligned. Now, I would say that actually it's good for a news organization to have diversity of thought, to not agree on everything, to push each other to think differently. They don't value that. They value an echo chamber. Um, and do I care if McDaniels is ever on NBC? I, I don't. I don't watch NBC to inform my worldview. I don't care. But it reinforces this notion that you don't have to listen to conservatives or vice versa, that conservatives shouldn't listen to liberals. Uh, and that if you don't like what someone says, you shouldn't even treat them as a person. Oh, and screw the golden rule. Right. Forget that. Don't treat people as you want to be treated. If they say something you don't like, let them burn. Crush their livelihood and their opportunities. Let them go stew in a corner and think about what they did was wrong. Now, this is something it, I mean, these are the same people who say the cancel culture doesn't exist. And then they go and cancel somebody like this. Um, I really like this from The Canceling of the American Mind, the new book from Greg Lukianoff and Ricky Schlott. They say this about if you want to say, well, this is just accountability. Ronna McDaniel said things that, you know, were not good. She doesn't deserve this network news spot. Here's what they say about the term accountability culture, is it assumes that con the conclusion is true by the very nature of the question or the statement. By using the term, one implicitly assumes that everyone who has been canceled has done something that warrants being accountable. We'd be shocked if you made it through this book, which is a book I do want to recommend that you read. It's fantastic. Um, but we're judging people as if like the jury's out, they're bad, that's it. They point out that in his 2022 book, Free Speech, Jacob McChamba says, there is a fundamental difference between reacting to ideas one loathes with scorn or criticism and demanding that specific viewpoints be purged and their authors and enablers punished with loss of livelihood or disciplinary sanctions, which is exactly what they're doing. Now, not only did they succeed in getting her contract revoked from NBC, they also got her kicked out of her talent agency. So CAA, which is a talent agency that would get her jobs, has dropped her. Again, these people went after and interfered with her livelihood, her ability to make, they, they find her so odious, they don't think she should make a dollar. That's how they feel. Uh, they, they'd be happy for her to rot in hell. And they're vin that's mean, right? And so this just proves that free speech laws, which were once used by the powerless against the powerful, have been weaponized by the powerful. It is these wealthy East Coast media elites who are cheering for the erosion of free expression, and they won on this one. So they will be drunk over this power unless they are held accountable. I almost do hope that she seeks a lawyer um, for her right to practice politics in a way that other people don't like and make a career out of it. I think the rest of us, though, we should show our kids this is wrong. Even if someone says something you don't like, you should hope that they are treated with compassion and engaged with respect, period. We should bring back the golden rule. That's one of the main points from the canceling of the American mind is tell your kids Treat people how you'd want to be treated. So what if I, because I feel that Rachel Maddow lied to me for four years, what if I interfered with her contract, not that I had that power, and I, and I made it my life's mission that she never work again, never earn another dollar, and go rot in hell? Well, that is not a practicing of the golden rule. So we need to bring that back. Uh, and point to these NBC employees as examples of odious, malcontented divas who laugh at other people's opinions rather than respect them 
teach your kids and your family that this is wrong. Uh, here's a recent example of that on Super Tuesday when all of these anchors made fun of their voters for caring about immigration. I mean, if you look at some of these exit polls, I mean, I live in Virginia. Immigration was the number one issue. <laughs> yeah. I mean, again, these could change in, in Virginia. Well, Virginia does have a border with West Virginia. <laughs> very, very contested area. Build the wall. Like, what? Yeah, because yeah, so all, all those West Virginia people are, in, you know, inhuman. So we want to keep them out of Virginia. Right. I um, wonder how our, our West Virginia viewers right. feel about that, you East Coast elites. Yeah, you're not that the... when people cross the border, they're, they're not it's not like they cross the border and there's like a force field there that keeps them in Texas or in Arizona. And like they they, they can travel. Yeah, we don't have border checks right. on every state. And they're laughing. So, oh, immigration. Yeah, like, immigration is your top concern. Joy Reid laughing. Ha about ha, it. <laughs> what you think you're not as smart as us. We're above you. Um, you know, this, I think, was one of the most the worst clips that shows that they are the baddies. But let me know what you think of this. Um, not that you, you know, I don't think anybody who would get through a segment like this would be like, but I like MSNBC. No. But, uh, you know, again, who's going to stop them from this bad attitude? Well, you, because you're not watching them. So, I mean, that's really all we can do is just turn them off and take away their power small, little by little. But me saying that. Well, and yeah. I, I thought Trump only won because of Russia. I mean, that was her. That's what she said. before. She promised me that that was the case. Yeah, yeah. she promised. Yeah. And that's it what, was about every day. It was every... not then about democracy. Yeah. All of her Hillary lovers, you know, that's what she promised every day on the show. That's like that's that was her whole shtick. And then, you know, when well, I was laughing when she would hold up the the documents, the, you know, the fake documents and she got crapped on all of that. You know, she just kept going and they just kept putting her on the air. Well, and MSNBC just kept putting her on the air. Why is she not talking about her team now working to get third parties off of all the ballots? Like, where's that story? Mm -hmm. That that doesn't matter if she's going to talk about democracy. No, she you, can't, you can't have a democracy with more than two parties. What are you talking about? That wouldn't be democracy. That, that, that would is, be yeah, anarchy. That's a good point. That would or just a, be crazy. Or a constitutional republic. Yeah. But we don't really have a constitution. We're, we're, as Mark Levin said, uh, we're like in a post-constitution era right now, which I think that's probably the case. And I want to make it clear. I don't really care much about Ronda McDaniels. I want everybody to be engaged, to engage across parties and across platforms in a respectable way. I don't want this to be this world we live in where you don't like someone's politics, so you cancel them and hope that they get hurt. That's what I care about. Yeah. All right, let us know your thoughts on that tonight. We really appreciate it. Um, hey, we have, a, we have a daily newsletter. We'd love for you to subscribe to our newsletter. Um, it publishes every morning. It's the world's best newsletter, by the way. The kids love it. You just walk down the street, you're going to hear kids talking about um, the redacted newsletter. And adults, too. Like, if you go to the mall and you see, like, the senior citizens at the, wall, the mall walkers, you know, they're talking about it on their morning walks in the mall, the, the redacted newsletter. Um, and if you go to have coffee at the Starbucks or other places, you're going to hear people talking about the redacted newsletter. It's the number one way to get some great news. Start your morning off right, like five to ten minutes. You can read it. You'll be in and out and no one will get hurt. And you'll laugh a little bit and hopefully you'll be more informed because we cover about, you know, a couple of stories you're not going to see in other places. Uh, and so you're going to you're going to get our coverage of that by going to redacted.inc. It's not .com, it's redacted.inc. Put in your email address, you'll receive a welcome email from me, and you just need to confirm that you want to receive the newsletter. So you got to make sure you confirm it, otherwise you won't receive it tomorrow morning. We publish it about 7, 7.30 a.m. Eastern time, depending on when Natalie finishes writing it, and I finish uh, adding in some other things in the newsletter. It's just the two of us that work on the newsletter. And then we publish it. So go to redacted.inc is the place to go. So thanks. thank you guys so much for signing up for that. We appreciate it. Well, that's going to do it for us today. Thank you so much for joining us. And thank you for uh, joining Clayton while I was away. Good to be back. We will be back here tomorrow, same time, same place. So please come back, uh, whatever platform you choose. We thank you for braving the news and the truth. See you tomorrow, everybody. That's Velma. Good night, everyone.